Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Does Science, and today I want to discuss the projection operator in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. As the name says, the projection operator projects one quantum state onto another. But why would we need to do that? There are in fact many situations in quantum mechanics where that is necessary. One that you're likely to use very often is that when we measure a property of a quantum particle, quantum mechanics tells us that the state of the particle collapses onto a different state. The projection operator allows us to mathematically describe this collapse. This means that before we can learn about any of these things, we must learn about the projection operator. So let's go! To define the projection operator, we start with a ket psi that we take to be normalized. The projection operator associated with this ket, which we write p psi, is defined as the outer product of psi with itself. And before we proceed, check out the video on operators if you need a refresher about outer products. Now that we have defined the projection operator, we want to understand what it does. To see it, we consider the action of the operator on an arbitrary ket phi. We first write out the projection operator explicitly as an outer product. We then rearrange this expression, and we set the bracket here between psi and phi as a scalar c. We can move a scalar to the front, and we obtain c psi. And here, c is the bracket between psi and phi. So what does the projection operator associated with the ket psi do? It acts on an arbitrary ket phi and gives us another ket that is proportional to psi. Additionally, the proportionality constant is given by the overlap between the initial state phi and the state psi that defines the projection operator. This is the reason why we call this operator the projection operator. It projects an arbitrary state onto the reference state psi. We can draw a simple analogy with what happened in the familiar Euclidean vector space. In two dimensions, the Euclidean vector space is spanned by x and y, and if we consider two vectors, a and b, then the projection of the vector a onto the vector b is this vector shown here in red. Now we can calculate it as a dot b hat in the direction of the b vector, where b hat is the unit vector in the b direction. What we get after projecting a on b is a vector along b whose length is the scalar product of a with b. This is analogous to what we get after projecting phi on psi, which is a state along psi with length given by the scalar product between psi and phi. Now that I have introduced the projection operator, the next thing I want to do is to study some of its properties. The first one is that the projection operator is idempotent. That means that it squares to itself. To prove this, let's write p psi squared. We then insert the definition of the projection operator as an outer product. We then rearrange this expression, and we find that the scalar product here is equal to 1 because the state psi is normalized, and this means that this expression simplifies to this outer product, which is simply the projection operator itself. So does it make sense that the projection operator squares to itself? If we project an arbitrary state onto psi once, we get a new state that is along psi. If we then try to project this new state again, we're already along psi, so nothing will change in the second projection. So it makes perfect sense that applying the projection twice is the same as applying it once. In fact, the impotency is a defining property of a projection operator. Any operator whose square is equal to itself is a projection operator. The second property of the projection operator is that it is Hermitian. To see this, let's consider the adjoint of the projection operator, which we can write as the adjoint of the outer product, and remember from the video on operators that the adjoint of an outer product simply reverses the order. So in our case we get this, and it is simply the projection operator itself. Now I want to look at the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the projection operator. Let's start by writing the eigenvalue equation, p psi acting on eigenstate lambda gives the eigenvalue lambda multiplying eigenstate lambda. We can then replace the projection operator by its definition as an outer product on the left hand side of this equation. And we realize that here we obtain a bracket that gives a scalar that I will call c. We can therefore rearrange this eigenvalue equation as c psi equals lambda lambda, where c is the bracket between psi and lambda. How can we solve this equation to find the eigenvalues and eigenstates of the projection operator? There are two possible solutions. The first one is that the eigenstate lambda is equal to psi. In this case, c, which is equal to the bracket between psi and lambda, then simply becomes the bracket between psi and itself, which gives 1 because psi is normalized. This implies that lambda, which is equal to c, is also 1. The second possibility is that lambda is orthogonal to psi. 
This implies that c is zero, and in this case lambda is then also zero. So do these results make sense? An eigenstate of an operator is a state that when you act on it with the operator, it is only multiplied by a scalar, but it doesn't change direction. For the lambda equals one case, we have a state that is already along the state onto which we're projecting, so it will still be parallel to that state after the projection. For the lambda equals zero case, we have a state that is orthogonal to the state onto which we're projecting, which will indeed give zero when acting on it with the projection operator, so it is perpendicular to it. Next I want to discuss a very useful property of the projection operator, which is that it allows us to write any ket as a sum of two other kets, one parallel to the reference ket psi and one perpendicular to it. To see how this comes about, consider an arbitrary ket phi. Then insert the identity operator, then add and subtract the ket p psi phi, which simply amounts to adding zero, and rearranging this last expression we obtain this here. Each of these two terms is an eigenstate of the projection operator. To see this, let's start with the first one. p psi acting on the first term gives us p psi squared acting on phi. Remember that the square of the projection operator is equal to the projection operator, so we obtain p psi phi. This equation tells us that p psi phi is an eigenstate of p psi with eigenvalue one. For the second term, we can also consider p psi acting on it. And operating through, we obtain this. And then the squared projector is equal to the projector, so the whole expression gives us zero. This means that one minus p psi acting on phi is also an eigenstate of p psi with eigenvalue zero. So what does all this mean? We can pick any ket phi and write it as a sum of two other kets like this. The first is parallel to psi and is an eigenstate of the projection operator with eigenvalue one and the second is perpendicular to psi and is an eigenstate of the projection operator with eigenvalue zero. What we just found about writing an arbitrary ket as a sum of two different kets is a feature of vector spaces that appears in many different contexts. Consider two vector spaces u and w that are both subspaces of another vector space v. If we can always use a vector in u and a vector in w, to write any vector in V as the vector sum of the first two, then we say that U and W span V and write it like this. Furthermore, if this decomposition is unique, which is equivalent to saying that U and W only share the identity element on the vector addition, then we say that V is given by the direct sum of U and W and write it like this. When this happens, we call U and W complementary subspaces. If we compare this to what happens with the decomposition up here, we see that an arbitrary state phi in V can be written as a sum of a two states, an eigenstate of the projection operator with eigenvalue one, which belongs to a subspace we call V1, and another eigenstate of the projection operator with eigenvalue zero, which belongs to a subspace we call V0. Additionally, the eigenstates of the projection operator are perpendicular to each other, so that V1 and V0 are complementary subspaces, and we can write V as a direct sum of v1 and v0. One very common way in which the projection operator is used in quantum mechanics is to project onto a subspace of the whole state space. The most convenient way of writing this down is in terms of basis states of our state space. For a basis u, we consider a subset of basis states u1 to un, which span an n-dimensional subspace of the full state space. We then write the projection operator onto this n-dimensional subspace as Pn, and it is equal to the sum from 1 to n of the outer product of the basis states in this subspace. To confirm that this is a projection operator, we start by calculating its square to check that it is equal to itself, because you will remember that this was a defining property of a projection operator. To do this, we first write out explicitly the projection onto the n subspace twice, we then rearrange this expression by moving the sums to the beginning. We then use the fact that we're working with an orthonormal basis. And this allows us to reduce the double sum into a single sum. And this last expression is equal to Pn, confirming that Pn is either potent, so it is a projection operator. We can also look at how Pn acts on an arbitrary ket phi, and we obtain this expression here. 
As expected, the cat PN phi lives in the n-dimensional subspace of state space, as it can be written in terms of basis states u that live only in this subspace, so that the sum runs from 1 to n. To recap, we have defined the projection operator P as an operator which is idempotent, meaning that it squares to itself. As examples, we have considered the projection on a cat psi, and then the projection operator is written as the outer product of psi with itself, and we have also considered the projection to an n-dimensional subspace of state space spanned by n states in a particular basis. We have also found that the projection operator has two possible eigenvalues. One corresponds to eigenstates which are parallel to the state onto which the operator projects, and zero corresponds to states perpendicular to it. Finally, we have seen how we can write any cat phi as a sum of two terms, one parallel and one perpendicular to the state psi onto which we're projecting. The projection operator allows us to project a quantum state onto another or onto a subspace of the full state space. Projections of quantum states find applications in all sorts of areas, from some of the most basic quantum mechanics concepts like measurements, to more advanced topics like systems of quantum identical particles. You can find links to all these topics in the description. If you liked the video or if you'd like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.